In almost all the examples we've seen, more than one dimension of science diplomacy is at play. We saw this with large-scale research infrastructures such as CERN, the ALMA telescopes, and SESAME. But science diplomacy is especially prominent in situations like the governance of transboundary resources, like the fish we discussed earlier. These always necessitate close interaction between science and the diplomacy. But what if a resource or a space is owned by no one? That's what is referred to as a global commons. As you may guess, science diplomacy is crucial there as well. Over 70% of the Earth's surface lies outside the territory of any nation. A country's water jurisdiction extends only 100 miles. That's nearly 161 kilometers from its continental shelf. Further than that, it's no man's land. No one owns outer space, just as no one owns the moon. Global commons are a key area for science diplomacy because by their very nature, they require multilateral approaches to governance and diplomacy that must be based on science. We've already discussed one global commons, Antarctica. The most important common interest articulated in the Antarctic Treaty was the freedom of scientific research, including the exchange of data and people. This is crucial to inform management strategies to protect the Antarctic environment and ensure the sustainable use of its resources. The Antarctic Treaty may offer lessons for the peaceful governance of other global commons. However, there are very few spaces where a similar treaty would make sense today. Why? There are several things about Antarctica that are unique, as Dr. Stone pointed out. It has no indigenous peoples. It's an entirely separate landmass, and it's not geographically close to any nation. There are not very many spaces like this, unless, of course, we begin to settle on another planet. So let me ask you, which of the following is not a global commons? The moon, the Arctic, or outer space? Turns out the moon is a global commons, and so is outer space. Both are unowned, supranational spaces. However, the Arctic is not. Contrary to what some people think, the Arctic is not simply the northern equivalent of Antarctica. Whereas Antarctica is an isolated continent surrounded by ocean, the Arctic consists of continental land masses semi-enclosing the Arctic Ocean. Crucially, the surrounding land masses are sovereign territories. Rather than being a global commons, the Arctic is what we call a shared space. Not only do sovereign nations own parts of it, but it does have indigenous peoples. Science diplomacy is crucial for shared spaces as well. Arctic is actually a fantastic example of science diplomacy, uh, and actually one of the primary examples that always comes to our minds first. And for the very good reason, um, scientific cooperation and scientific partnerships in the Arctic are of crucial importance, uh, primarily because of huge cost of operating in the, in the region, but also very high stakes that come, uh, that come into picture in pursuing scientific research um, in, in the high latitudes. Science collaboration was also critical and played a key role in developing environmental and geopolitical regimes that, that we see in the region. And one of the first, actually the first institution that was, uh, that was established between former Cold War adversaries was the International Arctic Science Committee. All three dimensions of science diplomacy are at play in this highly contentious region. What's more, the Arctic is a good example of how science diplomacy is more important than ever in the 21st century. The dynamics of the Arctic are changing. The Arctic Ocean is currently crossing an environmental threshold from a perpetually ice-covered region to a seasonally ice-free one. Essentially, that means a new coast is opening up. Look, science is, is fundamental in our foreign policy. Uh, since World War II, essentially, the whole founding of our foreign and defense policy in the post-Cold War period, the nuclear age, 
was founded on the science of the atom. Now we live in the climate age, and our understanding of the climate and of weather underlies much of what we need to understand about how the world is changing today, how we face new actors in the Arctic as we have a fourth coast and a, a new ocean opening up in that region, um, new entrance into that region from China uh, to Russia changing its its uh, activities in the Arctic. We, that is fundamental to American security interests and to our foreign policy. And this poses enormous diplomatic challenges. Suddenly, nations are interested in using the Arctic for energy, fishing, shipping, and tourism. In order to regulate these activities, more research is required into sea level rises, loss of sea ice, melting permafrost, the location and availability of resources, and the impacts of long-range pollutants. Much of this research will require international collaboration, especially when the harsh conditions of the Arctic necessitate the sharing of costs, logistics, facilities, and other capabilities. This new coast is changing the geostrategic interplay in the region, and science diplomacy will be crucial moving forward. <laughs>